All right, so yeah, welcome to our talk. Um, I think it's like a two-fold talk, so I will start with um, a little motivation about uh, decision-making and uh, minimizing loss function in machine learning. Um, <clears throat> then Santiago will take over and look at the algorithmic uh, probability approach uh, to enhance or enrich machine learning approaches. And we have uh, also uh, results we we'll show uh, and uh, yeah, showcase what is the advantage of using that. All right. Um, um, well, imagine a medical di uh, di diagnosis problem in which an MRI, MRI image of a patient's heart is given. So let's assume we wish to determine whether the patient has a heart disease or not. That's a sort of a common uh, problem in healthcare or diagnostic in healthcare. Uh, so the input vector is X, uh, is a set of pixel intensity uh, of the image, and the output uh, variable T will, is present, uh, will present the absence or the uh, existence of a heart disease. So we now know the existence of a heart disease by the class C1, or T equals zero, or, and a healthy heart by the class C2, or T equals one. Uh, the general inference problem then involves determining the joint distribution of X and the class CK. Um, the task is now to decide which of the two classes to assign to the image. Um, we are interested in the probabilities of the two classes given the image, which is the probability of the class uh, CK in that case, given uh, the input vector X. All quantities appearing in the bias theorem, uh, which can be obtained from the joint distribution of X and C, the class CK, by either marginalizing or conditioning those back to the appropriate value. So that's like the, the standard way to derive terms in the bias theorem. Um, using that bias theorem, uh, we can now interpret the, the, uh, the probability of the class CK as the prior probability of the class. CK and uh, the probability of the class C given the input vector X at the, uh, the corresponding posterior probability. In our binary case, that means uh, the property of class C1 presents, uh, represents the probability that a person has a heart disease before we take the MRI measurement. And uh, the, the latter, the posterior is um, yes, the class C1 given the input vector um, X is a corresponding probability uh, revised using by a theorem, considering the information contained in the MRI. So now one needs to, uh, a rule to that assigns each value of X to one of the variable uh, available classes, sorry. Um, so the goal is really to, to make a few mis, uh, to make as few misclassifications as possible. Um, a mistake occurs when an input vector of its sits belonging to a class C1 is assigned to the class C2 or vice versa. Um, the probability of making a mistake is minimized if each value of X is assigned to the class for which the posterior probability, CK given uh, 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 the input vector X, is largest. So such a rule will divide the input space into two regions, um, we call them RK called uh, it regions RK called the system regions, one for each class, um, such as that all points in uh, RK are assigned to a class CK. Well, uh, the probability of an error occurring is given by the by integrating the joint distribution of X and C1 as well as X and C2 over the regions R1 and R2. Um, so the, the the figure on the slide. Uh, you see the joint probabilities for each of the two classes are plotted against X together with the decision boundaries uh, X hat. While uh, values of X less than um, X hat are classified as classes belonging, uh, as class C2 belonging to decision region R2. Um, and on the other hand, points which X less than X um, hat are classified as C1 and belonging to the region R1. Errors arise from the blue, green, and red regions. For X less than X hat, the errors are due to the points from 
does C2 being misclassified as C1, uh, represented by the sum of the red and green regions, and conversely, or uh, for points in the region X less than X hat, they are also due to points from the class C1 being misclassified as uh, C2. So that's a blue region. Um, maybe I should point out that if you now move that um, uh, boundary x hat to the left where the x zero is, then basically you minimize uh, the, the arrow because the red region vanished and you basically have uh, uh, the best solution. Um, making a misclassification is not symmetric, meaning given a false negative on an MRI image, the patient uh, has heart disease but is classified as healthy, is more severe than the other way around, a false positive. One can define a loss uh, that we denote by the loss matrix, L in our case. Now, uh, the goal is that the class problem of the class problem is to minimize that average loss. Uh, that is achieved by averaging over the indices of loss matrix over the regions RRK with respect to the given distributions. Um, in deep neural networks, one has beside the impulse vector X, the target vector T, as in our case before, um, or the output vector Y, also weights uh, which are trained to optimize the activation of the network. For the standard multi-class classification problem in which each input is assigned to one of the K mutually exclusive classes, um, the loss function is given in a similar fashion as before, but the loss function is described in any dimensional surface sitting over weight space. So um, the standard method to minimize such error function is uh, the use of the gradient descent uh, method, uh, which updates the gradient base of the weights consistently until reaching the global minimum uh, of the error function. And to illustrate this, I have here a little diagram, which somehow shows that um, error surface. Um, and um, so in this figure, uh, WA is a local minimum, uh, WB is a global minimum. And then we have a point WC, uh, which is gradient, not E. And that uh, basically um, the, the, uh, the gradient, that is the uh, way you actually um, change and uh, adjust to find the global uh, minimum in that case. So, um, in general terms, given the training set X composed, I mean, now I'm basically going, I mean, that was like this classical uh, probabilistic uh, point of view on how to, to look at the problem of machine learning. So now I'm just preparing them for the next steps, um, a little bit more uh, generalized. So in general terms, uh, given the training set X composed on pairs of uh, vectors X, Y, called samples and, um, and, and will be also defined as um, sample weight uh, for each of the samples. We have a model or predictor M mapping vectors X to Y um, hat, well, that's the prediction. We define a loss function predictor L that measures how distant is our prediction from the desired output. And then further uh, define a loss or cost function J, uh, which uh, of M, X, and W, that averages or otherwise aggregates the loss incurred by the model on all the samples contained in X for the corresponding sample weights um, W. Now we have the task of training such an algorithm to optimize parameters of M over the training set X. All right, so. Um, the current machine learning paradigms, they have several limitations. That's basically also what we have tried to address in our, the, the next uh, part of the algorithmic uh, probability. 
So most important is the challenge of generalizing, uh, of general, uh, sorry, generalization beyond the training set. This is addressed by finding unbiased and representative data sets. Fine-tuning the bias variance, uh, one, one can approach this with several things, like fine-tuning the bias variance trade-off is a problem, um, um, uh, fighting the overfitting of a model, um, and uh, what, sorry, those are the problems. And, and the solutions would be then to just say, okay, adjusting the model design so we can see different topologies of the model change, adjust. We can um, mining for more relevant features in data, um, but also applying data augmentation. Um, but that is the limitation we want to overcome with the next part. So I can hand over to Santiago now. Okay, uh, I, I need you again to stop sharing your screen. Yes, I will do so. Last Jorgen again. Okay. Okay, so now is my part. So as, as Jorgen says, uh, for what in order to address this challenge, especially the issue of overfitting, which is a, an issue of generalization of the model beyond the training set, one of the proposals we have is, is to start using algorithmic information theory and algorithmic and algorithmic information dynamics. In, to start introducing them into machine learning. So first, let me start with an algorithmic loss function. So this is our definition of the algorithmic loss function, that this algorithmic loss function measures how far our predicted value is from the real value based on the deficit in information. That is, that is the information that is present in the real value, but not present in our predicted value. And for this, we have a, for this, for this definition, we have a, a theoretical justification. For this, let us assume that we have an, an ideal model for our training set. So this ideal model will produce the, well, the desired output for all inputs, but we also have a minimal, inform, uh, a minimal complexity with respect of the algorithmic information. So, now we have another model M. So for this model, that it's easy to see that, that, that there exists a program Q that for each of the samples, it, it will call us as a, a subprogram sub QI that will fix the output if this is not correct. So, uh, sorry, sorry. So now that we have this uh, output, this program, it's easy to see that this program, it's an upper bound for the, for the ideal model. But also this program, uh, the, the algorithmic complexity of this program is almost the same as the algorithmic complexity of the sum of the algorithmic of the loss, algorithmic loss over all the samples, plus the algorithmic loss, the algorithmic complexity of our model. So by minimizing the algorithmic loss function over the samples, along with the algorithmic complexity of the model itself, we are going to approach the ideal model. So this is the, our justification. And now that we have justified our algorithmic loss function, the cost function is simply a function that just aggregates all the loss incurred in the, tra in the training set. And we can also add a regularization term in terms of the only complexity of the model. But as we will show in the following slides, this is not necessarily. So 
how do we apply this algorithmic function into a real world problem? Let us start with classification. Uh, as in, in, a way, in artificial intelligence, a classification task is one that where the model uh, outputs a, a value that consists of a label of a class. This, this class set is, a, is normally a finite set. However, we cannot apply uh, our loss function to these labels because the, the, the labels are just uh, arbitrarily chosen and they, do, and they do not contain any, any information of the class itself. While the information of the class is contained by this, by this set, which is the set of all the objects that belongs to the, to the class. So if we apply the algorithmic function to this object, we have that our classifier must produce the class of object itself. It must produce all the, all the elements that belong to the class. So this might seem like a daunting task, but, but, is it, but this task is equivalent to just finding a function that assigns each class yeah, to assign to each object its respected label. This is because we can consider a program that, uh, that given the model that assigns its, its object to its class, simply runs it and then sorts each element to, to a respective class. Thus, we have all the, all the, all the classes set. So how do we apply this to the algorithmic class function? So here is the, well, the, the resulting equation. We have the algorithmic loss function is the algorithmic distance of each of the samples to the output of our model, which in this case is the set. So follows that the models must produce an algorithmic object, an object that is algorithmically close to all the samples Belong, belonging to each class. This is also known as a centroid. Here is a, a, a diagram of a plot of how a, a centroid normal, normally looks. We have the, the big uh, circle, triangle, uh, pentagon, and, and, and rectangles are the centroids, and all the objects are close to each of the centroids. However, instead of using the Euclidean distance that is commonly used for this kind of a classification task, we are going to use the algorithmic distance defined by the conditional of complexity. So in order to apply this concept to machine learning, we have uh, some challenge. The first challenge is of course that uh, the ergonomic complexity and the conditional ergonomic complexity are not computable. They are incomputable functions. And also they are not differentiable functions. So we cannot uh, apply algorithms some uh, methods such as gradient descent in order to minimize the algorithmic loss function. Here we have a plot. We, this is the plot of a algorithmic loss function applied to a simple regression problem. As you can see from this plot, the surface is far from being smooth. Uh, and it's easy to see that, uh, that applying gradient descent to this, it would simply not work. So how, do, how can we optimize uh, this, uh, over this kind of plots? For this, we have something that we call algorithmic ascent. We have that from algorithmic probability theory, the simple models are also the most probable ones. And also that this difference is exponential. If we have two programs of which, uh, of diff of which complexity differs on a M term, they are going to be an exponential two times two, two exponential M possible models within them. So the, the distance within the, these two objects is going to be exponential. Uh, so the basic pre premise of algorithmic accent algorithm is simple. We're just going to test all possible models 
or parameter for our model, starting from the less algorithmically complex one to the most algorithmically complex one. So here is how, uh, how the algorithm uh, looks formally. We're going to st we start with the, with the, first, uh, the first model, which is the less complex one. And then we're going to iterate over all the models one by one, measuring the cost in court. And when we meet a condition, with this condition is normally when the, when the, when the, the cost is smaller than a chosen parameter. Then we keep the model that produced the, this small cost. Now, this might seem like this is going to take a long time and it indeed uh, can take a long time. It's, 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 a, it's much more uh, slower than gradient descent. However, it's uh, exponentially faster than, uh, than random search or exhaustive search. In our test for the simple for a simple uh, regression pro pro uh, problem we have here, it was 65 times faster than random search. 65 times faster. So uh, what properties we have? When we have the algorithmic loss function and we optimize this function using the algorithmic ascent, we are going to inherit in several qualities from our from algorithmic probability theory. And these are universality. The algorithmic loss function is applicable to all computable domains. Uh, normally in, in, in machine learning, you need a, 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 <clears throat> a different loss function for your, pro, for your problems. For example, for classification tasks, we normally have the the, lo the lo logistic loss. Also, we, we, we're going to have robustness. We, we know that agreement probability is, is naturally biased against noise around that object. If we follow, if we follow algorithmic ascent, the first models that, that we're going to find that meet our requirements with high probability is going to have, is going to fit, it's, it's not going to fit towards random noise of the training set. And as a consequence of roughness, we are going to have a generality. Assuming that the objects we are analyzing have an underlying computable dynamic, by minimizing the complexity of the model, with high probability, the, the resultant model is going to generalize beyond the training set. In other words, we can say that uh, algorithmic probability theory is going to prevent, to prevent overfitting. Sorry. Okay, so the only issue we have is that uh, is the incompatibility of K, of algorithmic complexity. As, as we know, uh, the algorithmic complexity can be approximated from below. We have, for this, we have the uh, CTM and BDM. However, for our purpose, I, we're going to, to, to need conditional versions of these two algorithms. So first, let me introduce conditional CTM. Let us have uh, two sets, X and Y. And we have a relation, a computable relation within these two sets. We're going to define the conditional CTM as the number of pairs that belong to the relation divided by <clears throat> the num total number of elements in our relation. Note that, uh, that, that the relation is, is established by the comp a, computable, a computable relationship is going to be a computable relation. And for this, we have also conditional BDM. The conditional BDM is going to aggregate the CTM of all the segments of, X of, our, of our X that are not present on Y. And as with BDM, the conditional BDM is going to be more, more accurate approximation to the conditional complexity. 
than Shannon Entropy. Okay, now that I have presented my two tools, we can go into particular examples. The first example is finding the <coughs> underlying on underlying um, elemental cellular automaton. For these samples, we have we 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 choose a random number of of elemental cellular automaton, which are here. There are eleven of them, and the task was we have a binary image of size 32 by 32, which, which are generated by the rules established by the cellular automaton, given a, a random initiation string. So we, we would like to have a classifier that given one of these images, is going to find which automaton generated it. So our model is going to, to consist of 11 16 by 16 binary matrix, one for each class, which was optimized in a kind of a greedy way. So we will start with uh, 11 matrix of zeros. We are going to perform our limit ascent on, on the upper left corner, then on the then of the next corner on, on the right on the upper right corner then the lo the lower then the lower left and then the lower right corner so this step is going to, uh, to be equivalent to change one bit to each of the to each, each, each of the of to each of the segments and then measure the cost incurred by that sample and and iterate this step until we find a correct model, a correct, uh, yes, a, a correct centroid for, for the samples. So here we have the evolution, how it looks. We first, we, this is the, the matrix that minimizes the cost for the upper left quadrant. Then we, we, we go to, to the next quadrant and so on, until we have a 16 by 16 centroids that hopefully is going to be algorithmically close to all the elements belonging to the class. So we, we uh, benchmark our results compared to deep neural networks. In this case, uh, we have a deep neural network with uh, fully connected one, one layer, two layers, three layers, and four layers. Then we have something that, uh, a classifier that was developed by, by a scientist called Fernandez which he de which developed specifically for this problem. And as you can see, the, the naive neural networks, they're naive because they don't have a, they are general, they don't have any specialization done for this problem. Don't have a, get very good results for the training set, but for the test sets, the accuracy is, is low. So this is a, this is a symptom of overfitting, of lack of generalization beyond the training set. Now the Fernandez classifier did much better. And I will make a classifier, even though it was a very simple one, it has a very good performance for this problem, very close to the deep neural network, to the custom deep neural network. Okay. Now our next problem is a much harder one. We have a set of uh, 12 by 4 binary matrix representing the evolution of a randomly chosen cellular automaton based, of, based on 11 initial conditions. These are the 11 initial conditions. So in, in this case, we have a, a, a binary matrix. But instead of trying to find the underlying cellular automaton, we want, we want to find the underlying initial conditions. And the cellular automaton is random for all the samples. This, this problem is much more harder to solve. And for the algorithmic probability model which we choose for this task is are, are going to be 11 binary ve vectors, each one representing the an initial condition. And here we have, uh, well, the, the, the result of our training 
which we train it in the following way. Uh, we approximated the conditional cosmological complexity by means of conditional CTM implemented on the following way. We computed all the outputs of all possible 12 bit binary strings for, it, for the first 128 cellular uh, automatons, forming a set of pairs. And using this set of pairs, we define, we use it to define the conditional CTM for all six, for all six, six binary strings, because we removed uh, three bits to the, to the left and three bits to the right for all the samples. So in the end, we have uh, over 500,000 uh, pairs. And with that, we can apply the conditional CTM. And if a, if a, if, if a particular pair of input output was not present, in our set, we just assigned uh, a maximal, um, a maximal uh, CTM value of 20. So, how much, uh, how, was, how was the performance of this model? Well, the performance of this model, uh, cost of our model was of 99, of, 95% on the training set, on the test set, 96% for the training set. And as you can see, the deep neural networks did much worse than that. For, for the first two layers, we have a, a severe case of overfitting. And more importantly, the custom made uh, classifier for the previous problem, it fails to, to solve at all this, this, this new problem. So as you can see, it's not generous, generalizabled. However, our learning classifier has a, well, I, I, I would say that our performance for this experiment was, was very good. Okay, Jürgen, it's your turn. I think I, I just, oh, one second, let me share my screen with you. Okay, so I hope you see it on screen again. Sorry about this today. Do you see my screen? Yes. Good, super. All right, so I just want to conclude uh, the talk. Um, so basically what we we showed like the way how we can use um, the, the probability in classifying objects in this way, uh, classified so automata properties. And the, the, the key take on of and the whole exercise we did just showing that it is because, well, by using that uh, approach, we can actually generalize uh, training sets to test sets much more uh, consistently, which is usually a very hard um, topic for classical or uh, machine learning. Uh, so, I mean, you can either throw lots of more images into the problem and hope that it generalizes better, but we have shown that we can have a white model approach to achieve that consistently. And so, um, the uh, that's like the biggest take away now, if you think about the uh, medical application, using methods such as if that actually opens the door to explainable AI. And also the topic of misclassifying objects and the uh, moral um, consequences uh, of that. Then the other challenges um, um, is basically to integrate this, to have this kind of uh, computer approximation of the loss functions. So we yeah. Seems to be hard problem in most cases it is, but um, uh, we are able to show some of the approaches to achieve that. Um, so in other words, 
there's still a lot of work to do. Okay, we just started opening the box, but uh, the results so far seem to be very promising, and we are looking forward to apply those uh, the, the, um, the, the, the complexity to more challenging problems. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorgen. Thank you, Santiago, for the nice presentation. Now we have almost five minutes left for Q&A. So please drop in your questions in Q&A tab. I have more of a comment than a question myself. So I wanted to comment that um, this seems also to suggest that um, differentiation is probably not a, such a important property in classification problems or even AI in general as it was suspected before, I think, right? Because we are dealing with a completely discrete space and, and the discrete search. So I think that is one also one of the important results of this approach. Is that right? Um, Samir, you want to say something about it? Oh, sorry. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you do you say differentiation in terms of uh, mathematical analysis? Yes. Well, I would say that uh, more than the, the mathematical well, differentiation is a tool. Well, obviously, mathematical analysis was de developed before artificial intelligence, so it was more a case of well, we have this tool and we we can apply it to solve this problem. So. Uh, Given that, I don't see why it should be considered like a like a fundamental, a fundamental, a fundamental part of machine in, in of machine learning. I think it's just a tool that can use. It's, it's very well developed. It, it has gone. It, it, it has given very good results. But uh, it, there's no reason why it's, it's the only tool of, of the of the of or the best tool for the, for the for the task. Uh, Santiago, um, there is a question, I guess it's for you, so it's, I may have missed it, but have you compared these results with a very basic logistic regression in addition, of, in addition to a neural network? To a very uh, mm, logistic regression? In, in what way? You, you mean like a, a, a simple linear model applied using a logistic regression? Uh, I guess Alisa means that. That's not my question. Uh, Alisa, yeah. So he, she said yes. For the first one, for the first one, yes. I mean, the the performance is not very is, is not good for simple linear models such as logistic regression. For second one, uh, we didn't. So the others, yes, because we are using very shallow networks, which are basically approximation. Of the well, network. yes, I I I guess that's the that 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 network with just one layer is a logistic regression model. So, but I think we showed that there are not much difference between if we add any more layers, at yes. least for the first and second segment of two. Yes, and that's, that's the issue. It's very, it's, it's, it's very, very, very easy, almost trivial to get a classifier that performs very well on the training set. The problem is to get one that performs well on the test set. Right, in a classical approach, you would throw many more examples to the model and hope that it does generalize better. And then I guess the deeper models will perform is better, but that's not really the controllable. So I guess with that approach, we have a more controllable manner to achieve it even with little, yeah. I okay. wouldn't say effort, but. There is yeah. one more question from Felipe. Uh, can you see in the Q&A, Jorgen? Or yes, the... yes, I, I'm, reading, I'm, I'm reading that. Okay. Okay, so regarding the plateau and traditional regarding descent, which gets us stuck in local minima, do you have results? Uh, Comparing the capability of our approach to overcome the learning process. Okay, I think that the problem of local minima is is not as, as severe in our case, because uh, because uh, we are not navigating the surface itself. We are just iterating over what I I, I like to call the algorithmic space. So we are. Uh, 
going through all the possible solutions on the, on the algorithmic space by order. For the surface doesn't take into account, we only use the log function in order to test how good or bad is each solution. So, so yeah, but I think the answer is also we don't have a surface in that case. I mean, that's not really a differential surface. So well, it's like a, an uncomputable yeah, so surface. Yes, but so it's not really a one-to-one -one relationship so to see what a local or maximum or like a minima is. Huh? That's okay, getting stuck in approximation of a computable function. Will it, this is a shared issue with BDM. I mean, our method is only are only as good as, as, as we can approximate the our complexity. In this case, any kind of a smoothing is not going to work. So we, we have to rely on the, on numerical approximations. <laughs> 